Benjamin Gert Kornas. Part 13. Refracting a Gert Kornik patient. Steps of refraction. Tomography. Retinoscopy. Subjective refraction. Over refraction. Fine tuning. Comparison with the total corneal refractive power. Binocular balancing and measurement of the potential visual acuity if needed. Starting with the tomography. The tomography is important not only to diagnose and classify keratoconus and ectatic corneal diseases, but also to study the real corneal refraction and to calculate corneal refraction and manifest corneal refraction accordingly in addition to study the astigmatism, the real astigmatism of the cornea. And we usually do this by studying the amount of refraction in zones centered with pupil center, especially the 5 mm zone. Retinoscopy. In retinoscopy, we measure the power of meridians. So when I move the streak of light in a direction, it means that I am refracting that direction and measuring what is called the meridian power. And the axis of the streak by name is the axis of the correcting lens. So for example, if the meridian shows minus 3 diopters and the streak axis is 70 degrees, it is just like if we want to use minus 3 diopter cylinder oriented at 70 degree in order to give its effect at that meridian, which is the 160. By retinoscopy, we can determine the most accurate axis and we can determine the power. Starting with the most accurate axis. We all know that in keratoconus, we have the scissoring reflex because the scissoring reflex is the earliest sign, earliest clinical sign in keratoconus. Now, whenever I see this scissoring reflex, I have to rotate the streak in order to reach a place to avoid the scissoring reflex and to have an almost parallel inner streak. The inner streak is the light reflex through the pupil. And to make this inner reflex clearer and sharper, I'm going to use some spherical lenses, for example, minus two. Now, in this stage, I don't care about reaching any, the neutral point. What I am interested in in this stage is to align the outer and the inner streak. So as you see here, there is a break between the inner streak and the outer streak in the inferior part. This means that I have to rotate the outer streak in a direction in order to align the inner and the outer streak. By this, I should reach the most accurate axis, which is 110 in this example. After that, I can determine the power by manipulating the sphere. So I'm going to increase the lens from minus 2 into minus 3. As you see, the streak becomes clearer, sharper, and narrower. And when I reach minus 3.5, the streak becomes dim and wide, indicating the neutral point. So as you see, the axis is 110, but the meridian is 20. And this resembles if I use minus 3.5 diopter cylinder oriented at 110 in order to give its effect at the meridian that was being tested, which is 20 degrees. Subjective refraction. The steps of the subjective refraction are Measuring anchorage visual acuity, starting two lines above the anchorage visual acuity, using the slit lens, determining the axis, and finally determining the power. Starting with the visual acuity, let us take this example. A patient can see 20 over 63, and this is his anchorage visual acuity. Step number two is to start two lines above. Step three is to use the slit lens. By the slit lens, all meridians of the cornea are covered, and the only meridian that is tested is 
the orientation of the slit. And I will start from the meridian that I have obtained when I did retinoscopy and when I determined the most accurate axis. The most accurate axis was 110, so I'm going to orient the slit to be at 30. It means that I am testing the 30 degree meridian. I ask the patient to rotate the slit by his finger, or maybe I will do this, clockwise and anti-clockwise, in order to reach the clearest meridian for him. Let us suppose that the 30 degree meridian is the clearest one, and it gives him 20 over 63. This means that he is using the 30, or he is looking through the 30 degree meridian, while other meridians, which are irregular, are covered. Now, the patient sees 20 over 63 by this slit. When I add minus 1, maybe his vision will increase. By minus 2, his visual acuity becomes better, and same as minus 3. Minus 3 is the highest minus degree that gives him the best correct visual acuity. So the meridian of 30 has a power of minus 3. Now I'm going to rotate the slit to an opposite direction and of course the vision will be blurred. And I will start again with the lenses starting with the minus 3, with minus 4, and then minus 5. And I find that above minus 5 there is no improvement so I will stop at minus 5. So at this meridian the power is minus 5. Now to transfer these two values into an equation, we have to imagine that the patient needs minus 3 sphere and the difference between the two meridians is minus 2, so I will need minus 2 cylinder and this cylinder should give its effect at the meridian of the minus 5, so it should be oriented at the meridian of minus 3. So the patient has minus 3 diopter sphere, minus 2 diopter cylinder at 30. Step number 4, over refraction. In over refraction, I am going to test the axis of the cylinder. I do this very simply by orienting the streak vertically. And if I am at the neutral point, I should see the inner streak dim and wide. So I'm going to over minus the patient and I'm going to use minus 4.5 instead of minus 3. By this, the inner streak will become narrower and sharper. And the movement of the outer streak is same as the movement of the inner streak. To understand the importance of this step, I'm going to move the cylinder away from the 30 degree. In this case, I will find the inner streak is not continuous with the outer streak. There is a break between both. Although the movement is still in the same direction because the patient is over minus. Now I have to move the minus 2 cylinder in a direction, for example, clockwise, in order to make the inner streak as close as to the outer streak. I can do this in 5 degree steps until I reach the point where the inner streak is continuous with the outer streak. Fine tuning. In fine tuning, I'm going to use the cross cylinder, and as you know, there are three powers of the cross cylinder, plus minus 0 0.25, plus minus 0 0.5, and plus minus 1 diopter. So starting with this patient, he has minus 2.5 diopter sphere, minus 2 cylinder at 30. 
The first step is to fine tune the axis. In order to fine tune the axis, I should align the handle of the cross cylinder parallel or coincide with the axis of the minus two cylinder. And I'm going to ask the patient the following question, which is clearer? Position number one, position number two, position number one, position number two, and I will move the cylinder accordingly. Now let us suppose that the patient says this position is clearer. This means that I need to move the axis of the cylinder towards the minus sign because the cylinder is minus. So minus towards minus and plus towards plus. Of course I'm going to do this by five degree steps and of course I have to readjust the handle of the cylinder to be aligned with the axis of the cylinder. So I can do this again and again until I reach the best axis. Then I fine tune the power. When I fine tune the power, I have to use the cylinder, but the handle is not aligned with the axis of the cylinder. The thing that should be aligned with the cylinder is the signs. So I will start with the minus superimposed over the axis of the cylinder, and I will ask that patient the same questions. Position number one, position number two, number one, or number two. Now let us suppose that the patient says this position is clearer than the previous one. So in this case, I am putting or adding plus values over this cylinder. It means that I need to reduce the power of this cylinder. So I'm going to reduce it into minus 1.5 and I may retune using the 0 0.25 in order to have finer tuning. After that, I have to fine tune the sphere by using the red-green balance. Let us suppose that after this red-green balance, I find that minus 275 is the best with minus 1.5 cylinder at 25 degrees. Now I have to compare the subjective refraction or the manifest refraction with the total corneal refractive power of the cornea itself. How we do this? Let us have an example. If we look at the total corneal refractive power map at the five millimeter zone centered with the pupil center, K1 is 49 at 30, K2 is 52 at 120. In order to calculate the corneal refraction, please refer to the video Quick Guide to Reading Corneal Tomography Part 6. So if I calculate this cornea, it shows minus 8.5 diopter sphere with plus 3 diopter cylinder at 120. Now, to calculate the corneal manifest refraction, please refer to the video Quick Guide to Reading Corneal Tomography Part 4. The manifest corneal refraction of this patient is minus 10.63 diopter sphere plus 2.4 diopter cylinder at 120. And if I convert it into the other equation, it shows almost minus 8.25 diopter sphere minus 2.5 diopter cylinder at 30. Now I'm going to compare this corneal manifest refraction with the manifest refraction that I obtained during the subjective refraction. If we compare the cylinder, we can find there is no big difference, but if we compare the sphere, there is a big difference, and this can be explained by the compensation by the axial length of the eye. Now suppose we find a big difference in cylinder between the corneal manifest refraction and the manifest refraction, maybe in axis or in amount. In this case, we have to recheck the patient, we have to recheck the eye, and we may try the corneal manifest refraction and maybe we will get better vision. Now the last step in the list is binocular balancing. After we check each eye separately, we have to check both eyes together in order to do 
binocular balancing. Binocular balancing aims at giving the most comfortable spectacles to the patient. And this can be done by manipulations. Vertical horizontal manipulation, parallel manipulation, manipulating the sphere and manipulating the cylinder. Starting with the first manipulation, it is the vertical horizontal manipulation. Let us have this example. The right eye has minus 1.5 diopters cylinder at 25. The left eye has minus 2.5 diopters cylinder at 170. Now I'll give this trial spectacle to the patient and ask him to walk for at least 5 minutes in the waiting area in order to check it. Now let us assume that the patient comes suffering from headache or tilted objects or vertigo or shadows. In this case, I need to do the manipulation in order to reduce his suffer. I'm going to look at the axis of the cylinders and I will ask myself, these axes are close to the vertical axis or to the horizontal axis. As you see here, they are close to the horizontal axis or to the horizon. So I'm going to rotate the right eye cylinder clockwise and the left eye cylinder anti-clockwise to make them as close to the horizon as possible. And I will do this in five degree steps until I reach a point at which the patient is satisfied. Let's have another example. The right eye has minus three diopters cylinder at 75 and the left eye has minus four diopters cylinder at almost 130. The first question is, are they parallel? No, they aren't. The second question is, are they close to the horizon or to the vertical axis? They are almost close to the vertical axis. So I'm going to rotate the left eye clockwise in order to make it as close to the vertical axis as possible. And I may do this also to the right eye anti-clockwise in order to make it as close to the vertical axis as possible. Now the other manipulation is the parallel manipulation. Now when the patient is not satisfied with the previous manipulation, the vertical horizontal manipulation, I may try with him the parallel manipulation. The parallel manipulation aims at making the two axes as parallel to each other's as possible and I may start with either eye. So I may start with the right eye to make its axis, the cylinder axis, as close or as parallel to the left eye cylinder axis as possible or vice versa. So in this example I'm going to rotate the left eye cylinder axis anti-clockwise to make it as close to the right eye axis as possible. And I'm going to do this in five degree steps. Now we have to remember that when the axis have been changed in large amounts, we expect that the amount of correction has changed as well. So we need to manipulate the sphere and manipulate the cylinder in 0 0.25 diopter steps to be sure that the given correction is giving the best correct visual acuity with the least amount of dissatisfaction. Moreover, we have to remember that binocular balancing is done if we want to prescribe glasses, but if we aim at choosing the best option of surgeries, no need to do any manipulation. Finally, we have to measure the potential visual acuity. Measuring potential visual acuity is a must when the corrected visual acuity is or less than 0.6. And we usually do this by using the hard contact lenses, the trial contact lenses. Potential visual acuity is very important because it affects our decision making. Thank you very much.